Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. During the early and rainy spring of 2003, I was visiting my sister who lived in rural Vermont. I was a smoker at the time and would frequently go outside on the porch by myself to smoke late at night, sometimes well after midnight. While outside, I would often hear large sticks being cracked and broken. I didn't think much of it, as I'm a seasoned camper and outdoorsman. Most sounds we hear in the woods can be explained away as just known animals. Let's just say my mind was changed one night. I was out on the porch. It was close to midnight. I heard what sounded like an animal scraping down a tree. It was distinct, like the bark was being scraped off from the top of a tree all the way down to the ground, where I then heard a thud. I tried looking for movement, but saw nothing, obviously, as it was too dark to see a thing, even though there was significant moonlight, and the floodlights were on every time I was out there, and were brightly shining in the direction of the woods. On the subsequent nights, I took a flashlight and tried to shine it on whatever animal it might be, but that was to no avail. Even though everything was brightly lit, I saw nothing at all. I tried this night after night. The sounds were there every single evening without fail. I could hear them moving closer and closer to me the longer I was out there. During the day, I looked for tracks and marks on trees or other evidence, but didn't turn up a thing. I picked up sticks and broke a few to see what size stick I was hearing. I ascertained that the stick diameter was about an inch. I had my 12-year-old nephew go out in the woods to jump on sticks and see if he could break some of them so I could check the way it sounded from where I was sitting, trying to judge the distance. He jumped on some, but because they were kind of moist, he could only break the smaller ones. He weighed about 75 to 80 pounds. So, this told me, whatever it was weighed way more than that. I could break the bigger ones by jumping on them, but I weigh 150 pounds. There are no animals in that area that are really large and could break that stick size based on the test I did. Whatever it was would move in close to me, so I asked my nephew to run around and make similar noises to gauge the distance in the daylight when they were at their closest. They were about 20 to 30 feet from me at best. I know there was more than one of them because I could hear one beside the house, and another one was in the front at the end of the driveway. They moved in very close to where I was, and I could hear them coming from two different directions. They were not visible with the naked eye at all. I tried to take some digital photos, but saw nothing discernible in the pictures. Another thing that happened while I visited was the feeling I was being watched when inside the house. I wrote it off as just my imagination. Then. There was the issue of the dogs barking and howling every night from their crates in the basement. It was as if they were hearing something. They would start their howling and wouldn't stop unless someone would go down there and make them stop. They would also look out the windows late in the evening and start barking out behind the house as though something was there. We all thought it was just another animal and wrote it off. My entire time there, I heard and sensed things. 
but I never once saw anything. All I can say is that I'm not losing my mind. Like I said, I'm an experienced camper and outdoorsman, so when something is out of the ordinary, I take notice. My trip came to an end, and I went home, but the story goes a bit further. My sister later divorced and started dating again. Her new boyfriend and I were talking on the phone one evening recently, and the subject turned to the paranormal. I knew he's an avid hunter and familiar with those parts, so I asked him if he had ever heard of anything like this. He said yes. He said that a few years back, he and five of his friends were out hunting. They had set up camp for the night and made a fire. As they were all sitting around after midnight, getting settled for the evening, they started hearing sticks breaking all around them. They didn't see anything and couldn't figure out what it was. They did shine their flashlights, but couldn't see anything. All five got spooked and decided to turn in for the night. And when the morning came, they decided to move their camp further up the mountain, closer to where they knew a larger group was set up. They decided not to talk about the event after that day and decided to never go back. And that's how spooked they got. I was so glad to hear someone else had experienced this type of thing. Now, at least I know I'm not nuts. I know there are others out there who've had similar experiences. So please, step up and let's hear your story. On to the next one. This story happened to me a few years ago, while I was still in high school with some friends. We had started a music band. At that time, we all liked metal, all had long hair, and the dream was to become stars. We were all very influenced by black metal, and our stage gimmick was our costumes and makeup. We already had a few songs done, and now the goal for us was to have a music video. As you can imagine, we chose the edgiest approach. We decided to shoot our video clip at night in a graveyard. To give you a little bit of an explanation and detail, the band consisted of three members. In the band, I played drums, Andy the synthesizer, and Brian was our singer. We had absolutely no budget. One of us was going to be the cameraman, while the other two would take part in various scenes in the cemetery. We had no authorization to film at night in the cemetery, and had not even thought of getting one. So, we decided to hide and make this clip in a completely illegal way. We couldn't bring our musical instruments with us while we were shooting these scenes, and the majority of the video showed us playing in one of our garages, but only a few scenes in the graveyard where we would be walking around. Brian's parents had a video camera at the time, one of those old cameras that worked with small videotapes. So, we borrowed it from them, and started to get to plan our adventure. We had everything ready in our backpacks, everything we needed to put on makeup, to dress up, to film, and then to leave without being seen. At that time, none of us had a car, so we decided to spend the night at the house of the person who lived closest to the cemetery. Brian lived about 15 minutes away by bike. At around 1 a.m., we would leave his house, get on our bike, and ride to the graveyard. We had already been there several times in the previous weeks to check out the place. It was easy for us to enter. Nobody was guarding the place, and the gate was even unlocked. We went in and went directly to the oldest part of the cemetery, the one with the most interesting graves to film, and that would make the best possible video. Don't think that we were some kind of delinquent who decided to go and deface the graves. 
We were all very respectable teenagers and had absolutely no desire to do vandalism. Now that we had arrived in the right part of the cemetery, it was time to dress up and put on makeup. We all wore long leather coats and makeup much like the band Kith to give you an idea. Brian had a long sword, completely unusable, but part of his costume. We started filming ourselves. Most of the shots had the camera on a tripod, but sometimes one of us would hand the camera over to do traveling shots following one or both of the others. We really didn't have a clear idea of all the scenes we wanted to do. We needed almost two hours to shoot the majority of the footage we wanted, but we weren't sure we had enough time. So we decided to keep going until we ran out of videotape. Just before four, we heard a sound coming from another part of the cemetery. As you can imagine, the cemetery and surrounding area was extremely quiet as well. The moment we heard this sound, everyone stopped, froze, and stood there listening. Do you think someone is out there? whispered Andy. Quick, we have to get out of here, said Brian. We hurriedly put the camera and our costumes away, and we began to walk quietly toward the exit. The sound we heard continued, and after a few meters, we stopped and began to look at each other in amazement. What the heck is that? I asked the other. No idea, answered Brian. It sounds like someone's digging a grave. No, not at this hour. It's impossible, I said. The guard works during the day. And besides, who would dig a grave by hand without using any machines? It sounds like the sound is coming from over there. Andy told us, pointing to the point of origin. We should have a view of what's going on when we'll be at the gate. Let's have a look before we leave. But we better not get caught. So we kept walking quietly. We were almost crawling not to be seen. When we arrived at a dozen of feet away of the entrance, we turned toward the direction of the origin of the noise that we had heard. I tried for a few moments to perceive where these sounds could come from. Then I heard Brian whispering next to me. What the heck is that? I looked at the direction he was pointing to, and that's when I saw the creature. I want to say that none of us that night drank or took any other drugs. We were all sober, and I don't think all three of us had the same hallucination. On one of the newly made graves, a huge four-legged thing was scratching at the earth. We were a good twenty yards away and in the dark. It was difficult to see anything, but I think the creature was at least five feet long. It was on all fours like a dog. It was scratching hard at the freshly turned earth. Its tail was short like a Rottweiler, and the muzzle, from what I saw of it, was elongated like a wolf. The creature had short hair, and it was possible to see the stronger muscle beneath the skin when it scratched the soil. I think at that moment, all three of us were fighting against the urge to get up and run like heck screaming. The creature had not seen us, but what if it had? Would it have grabbed us and devoured us? I didn't want to find out. We managed to leave the graveyard without being seen. We quickly got on our bikes, and I believe that none of us has ever been able to go so fast as that night. In the morning the next day, we swore never to mention it. What we saw, whatever it was, to other people partly because we knew we had no right to be in the graveyard at that time, and because we were well aware that if the graveyard or any of the graves had been defaced, and we told anyone that we were there at the time, people would most certainly think that we were the cause of the defacing, and not a giant, dog-like monster from hell.
I've lost touch over the years with Andy and Brian, so I don't know if they told anyone about this night. It's been so many years. I can't say that I know what was out there that night, but I think this creature, if it exists, is extremely dangerous. On to the next one. Around Traverse Fire near Goose Bay in Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada, a hairy humanoid was seen. It was called the Traverse Spine Gorilla and was seen in the area in 1913. The creature had white ruff across its head and was seven feet tall when erect, though sometimes dropping to all fours. The creature also often visited an isolated farmhouse and was even known to wield a stick when defending itself against dogs. Like many of our phenomena and our phenomenal animals, they tend to suddenly appear for a period and then they disappear again. They are not fond of dogs either. On one occasion that year, a little girl was playing in an open grassy clearing when a large man-like creature with low hanging arms appeared from out of the woods. It was seven feet tall when it stood up, but also walked on all fours as it approached her. Across the top of its head was a white mane, and the creature grinned at her as it approached, and she could see its white teeth. The creature beckoned to her, but she ran away screaming. There were numerous footprints in the mud and snow, showed a 12-inch long foot, narrow at the heel and forking at the front into two broad, round-ended toes. The creature ripped bark off trees and rooted up huge rotten logs as if looking for grubs. Numerous bear traps were set for it, but to no avail, as were numerous hunting parties. Hunters waited around Mud Lake for it. At times, the gorilla was seen to be carrying a club. On to the next one. Around midnight on April 1989, on River Road in Newfoundland, Diana Fleming and her husband were driving along a deserted road when they spotted a bizarre creature that appeared to be running swiftly behind their car. It propelled itself on two huge hind legs in an erect manner. It was dark and hairy in appearance. It had bright, glowing red eyes. Before spotting the creature, they had noticed a dead cat in the middle of the roadway and later on saw additional dead cats thrown along the road. The area is located near a military installation. On to the next one. Edgar Harrison became interested in Louisiana's Missouri Momo monster after it visited his property in the summer of 1972. A black, hairy creature, six to seven feet tall, splattered with blood and carrying a dead dog under one arm, appeared on the Harrison's land on July 10th, frightening the children. The family's own dog became ill in the wake of the sighting. The canine eye turned red, and it vomited for some time after the encounter. Four days later, Harrison and about a dozen others were talking after their regular Friday evening prayer meeting at the local Pentecostal church when they saw two fireballs shoot from Marzoff Hill in an area where Momo was thought to linger. The first fireball was white and colored, followed about five minutes later by a second which was green. Both fireballs descended into the tree line behind an abandoned schoolhouse. On the same night, UFOs were seen over the nearby town of New Canton, Illinois. Harrison's search for Momo compelled him to collect stories from other witnesses. Several reports include a small light which exploded and seemed to leave a foul odor behind. Harrison concluded that the horrible stench accompanying these sightings was meant as some sort of distraction. On the night of July 26, another fireball was seen atop a cottonwood tree near River Road in Louisiana. It shot out two beams of red light before speeding out of sight. 
On the following three nights, colored lights appeared over a limestone bluff at the north end of River Road. Witnesses from the Shane and Harrison families felt as if the lights were signaling one another. The same evening, the entire Shade family witnessed what Mr. Shade called a perfect gold cross on the moon. The road was lit up bright as day from the cross, said Mr. Shade. July 29th found Harrison and some college students standing atop Marthoff Hill, hearing what sounded like a gunshot from the road below. They hurried down the road, the hill in the direction of the sound. They all heard the phrase, You boys, stay out of these woods, uttered by what sounded like an old man. A thorough search of the area failed to turn up whoever or whatever issued the warning. The disembodied voices continued on August 5th when a man named Pat Howard, along with an unnamed friend, were camping in Harrison's yard. A voice from nowhere declared, I'll take your cup of coffee. Another search failed to heal the speaker. The following night at 9 p.m., a glowing orange UFO with what appeared to be lit windows landed in a thicket atop the same limestone bluff where the colored lights were previously seen. It stayed in place for five hours. Lewis Shade, who then watched the UFO fly away, it went straight up into the air and disappeared, according to Shade. Backtracking to August 3rd, after hearing a high-pitched howl just before dawn, Mr. and Mrs. Bill Suddarth found four three-toed tracks in the mud of their garden. Clyde Penrod, a hunter and friend of the Suddarths, came to make a cast of the prince. He was confused not only by the three-toed structure of the track, but by the track itself. The footprints showed no beginning or end. They were only four isolated tracks with no others discovered elsewhere on the property. It was 20 to 25 feet from the tracks to anything else, said Penrod. I can't understand how they were made. Located in the Dairy Township, Pennsylvania, the Bell Farm was home to both Bigfoot and UFO sightings. On the night of September 18, 1973, Mrs. Bell, a pseudonym assigned by Stan Gordon, was walking to her vehicle when she saw a dark figure standing upright about ten feet away. The hairy creature took a step towards Miss Bell and raised its long arms. Miss Bell cried out in fear, and the creature returned a cry as if mimicking her. Miss Bell issued an even louder scream and ran toward her house. Again, the creature answered her cries as it fled the scene. Others had previously sighted Bigfoot in the vicinity and heard weird screams from the woods nearby. Mr. Bell and another man searched for the creature in the surrounding field, but instead found a UFO, large, luminous, and tube-shaped, hovering over the hills behind the farm, its red glow illuminating the ground. Mrs. Bell, who had also sighted the UFO, said, I don't know if it has anything to do with this thing the creature, but every time we see that or hear that, that light is pretty close. The bells, along with other locals, reported another unusual light, a bright, star-like object would regularly appear in the sky to the northwest around 10 p.m. The light appeared larger than a star or planet and alternated between silver, red, and black. Barry Clark observed this UFO one night in September 1973, Earlier that same evening, Clark heard the cry of what he presumed was a Bigfoot. I actually got to hear that thing scream. It was an earth-shattering scary scream. It started out as a very deep rattling and then turned into an awful howl and growl at the same time. Later, Clark watched the bright light change color in the sky. He drove to a nearby hilltop where he met others observing the strange light. The object issued five flashes, each about one second apart, which lit up the sky in descending rings of deep red. Subsequently, the sky was littered with small silver lights gravitating toward the larger light, which had itself turned solid red. The silver light became red as they approached the larger light, which grew in size and started approaching the ground. 
The observer fled the area. Jeff Martin was fishing near Galveston, Indiana in October of 1973 when he heard something moving in the foliage behind him. He turned to see a sandy-hued, ape-like creature watching him from around 20 feet away. He called out to the creature, but it turned and quietly sunk back into the wood. After a few minutes, Martin felt something touch his shoulder and turned to see the creature standing nearby. The Bigfoot took off running, like a man on a rope being pulled too fast by a car. Martin pursued the creature, but it easily outran him, leaping over a ditch and disappearing into the woods once more. A short time later, Martin observed a glowing bronze object rise above the trees and streak into the sky. Martin returned to the site the next day and did not notice anything out of the ordinary. He returned again the following evening with a group of people including his fiancée and her father. They claimed their car was followed for most of the ride to the site by a glowing white light. The white light disappeared once they reached a nearby bridge. When they arrived at the site, they were surprised to find the Bigfoot as if it was waiting for them. The creature watched motionless from the weeds, standing eight to nine feet tall. The group exited the car and shone their flashlight at the creature. The beams seemed weaker when they hit the Bigfoot. It seemed to absorb the light. The creature remained still, emitting a musky odor. In an effort to get the creature to move, some of the group began throwing stones. They were unable to tell if the stones were hitting the Bigfoot, bouncing off or passing through it, but the creature remained motionless. When an approaching vehicle forced the witness to move their car aside, they returned to find the Bigfoot gone. On to the next one. I'm part of a crew of hotshot firefighters. I work seasonally for the Forest Service. And I'm based in a small town in southwestern Oregon, although my crew will go wherever needed to fight fires. We're in top condition and often work in the hottest part of a fire, thus our name of hotshot. My crew has 20 total, mostly guys, The women are becoming more common. But it's hard work, and most people don't have what it takes. It requires mental as well as physical conditioning. We're the elite of firefighting teams, along with the smoke jumpers. People say we like to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's dangerous work. So, I'll make this story short, as there really isn't that much to it, and you can choose to believe it or not. I don't care either way. I've been ridiculed over it, so I've developed a bit of an attitude, and I usually don't even bother to tell it to anyone anymore. There just happens to be a big fire in the Manita LaSalle Forest of southwestern Utah. And it had been whipped up by wind and hot, dry conditions. So we got the call. As the resources had been stretched thin down there, and it appeared that structures were being threatened, it was late in the season, September. The fire was backing down one slope toward Interstate 15 and on the other front, was burning toward Interstate 70, totally out of control. Picture a big square with I-15 on the left and I-70 on the top, and you'll get the idea. It hadn't yet burned where the two met, and we didn't want that to happen. The fire was about 30,000 acres at that point, and they were letting the interior burn out the thick, overgrown vegetation that comes from fire suppression, which had been the norm for many years. They were just trying to maintain the fronts from doing any more damage, but now that things were getting to the interstate, there was a real concern. So, my crew, along with another hotshot crew from Nevada, was staying in a spike camp along the two engines right along I-70 to monitor and contain the fire where it might jump the freeway. The freeway had been closed because of the thick smoke and danger, and everyone wanted this fire to just back off so they could reopen it. So 
We were also doing some ground ignition, setting backfires. The smoke was as thick as I've seen anywhere, and a hot wind was blowing in from the west. I was told that the interior of the area had burned in a mosaic pattern, with some unburned areas that had been skipped over by the fire, and I think that would kind of explain where what we saw came from. I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, my crew got the word that we needed to get further west along the freeway as a new branch of the fire was coming up from the interior in that direction. So we took off, and it was kind of weird to have the big four-lane freeway all to ourselves. We just tooled along on the eastbound lane, going the wrong way, even though it was the right way for us. We soon got to where we needed to be and got to work setting backfires. I could see a big column of smoke coming our way and the wind was blowing straight towards us. I was working along the northwest flank of the fire when I sat down to take a break and drink some water. I was sitting on the guardrail, just sitting there, and that when I saw them. It was just too bizarre, believe me. The smoke was thick and I was looking right into it, where the west wind was blowing it toward me, when I thought I could make out some figures. I was surprised, because I was on the outer perimeter, and everyone else was east of me. I remember thinking at first that it was part of my crew, but then realizing it wasn't, and wondering, what the heck are people doing over there in the smoke? As I watched, a line of figures emerged from the smoke, walking slowly like you would if you were in pain or feeling defeated. Maybe it was smoke inhalation. I don't know why, but they were walking slow. And as they emerged from the swirling smoke, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. These things weren't people at all. At first, I thought they were bears. We will often see wildlife of all sorts fleeing from fires, but it soon became obvious that they weren't bears. They had faces that seemed human, what I could see through the smoke, but they were covered in dark hair which hung from their arms, and they didn't seem to have any neck. It was like they were wearing hoodies, you know, jackets with the hoods up, and they were very muscular. The line of figures was maybe 50 feet from me, and they acted like they didn't even see me. There were seven of them. They looked like adults, all very large, maybe eight feet tall. Then behind them came four smaller ones, like kids, various sizes, from about three feet to four feet or five feet tall. At the very end was another very large adult. One of the adults seemed to be carrying something that looked like a young one. They trudged to the guardrail and stepped over it like it wasn't even there, then crossed the freeway, the median, then the other side of the freeway, then disappeared into the forest. Not one of them acknowledged me, even though I know they had to be able to see me. I sat there for a long time, trying to figure out what I had seen. And then a chill went up my spine, and I thought I was going to throw up just from tension. Shortly thereafter, some of my crew came over to help me work the flank, so I got back to work. I never said a word to anyone. It was the most bizarre thing that ever happened to me in my life, watching those ghost figures in the smoke. On to the next one. My friend and I were hiking on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range above Lake Tahoe and the Carson Valley above the town of Genoa. Both of us grew up in this area. Although in high school, I was kind of a cut-up. My friend Linda graduated valedictorian of our class five years earlier. She is very logical. We have often hiked this trail that basically goes straight up the mountain and over to Tahoe. It is a strenuous hike. When we parked our truck at the trailhead, there was another car parked there as well. We were about a quarter of the way up the trail when two teenage boys came running down the mountain toward us. The trail was extremely steep, 
and they were running for all they were worth. They stopped long enough to implore us not to go any further up the mountain as they had seen a monster or something. There was an old deer hunter's cabin about the halfway point and we told the boys we were only going to go that far. We thought they were drinking or on drugs. We shrugged off the incident. I laughed and joked that we wished we had what they were smoking. We reached the cabin without incident and sat down on the bluff that overlooked the Carson Valley. We split a soda that we had brought, and I took out my recorder, a flute-like instrument, and began playing some little tunes on it. We were alone on the mountain, we thought. After about an hour of putzing around, we decided to head back down the trail. I kept smelling dog dew or something dead. I even checked my shoes. We were near the creek gathering pine cones for an art project. I was facing downhill. Linda was facing uphill. We were examining a particularly perfect cone when Linda looked up and exclaimed, Oh my God, it's a bear. No, it's a guy in a bear suit. I looked up and couldn't believe it. We were a stone's toss from a seven-foot hairy dude. He looked directly at us, and to this day, Linda and I felt something pass between the three of us. He stood across the creek from us. His hair was the color of dry pine needles and covered his whole body with the hair thinning just on the chest and face. He had a large, broad chest, but not breasts like a female. His arms were hanging at his side nearly to his knees, and when he walked, he took long strides, and his arms swung freely as he walked. He didn't seem to fear us, although he began to walk straight up a pine needle-covered slope barefoot without slipping. As he moved away, Linda grabbed my arm and began dragging me down the hill. I couldn't take my eyes off him, and he never took his eyes off us. I do not feel to this day as he meant to harm us, but instead... I feel he was just as fascinated with us as we were with him. His face seemed almost sincere, with very intelligent eyes. His face resembled an orangutan. He had large eyes and a flattish nose. I sketched a picture as soon as I got home, and Linda confirmed that I had captured his likeness. I wish I had a camera on me that day. As we continued, at a fast pace, down the hill, he remained on the ridge above us, paralleling us in the same direction. We reached our truck and could still see him crouching on a granite boulder at least a football field distance between us. I yelled up to him that he was very cool, but he shouldn't be scaring the crap out of us locals. He stood up on his boulder and Linda told me to shut up and get in the truck. We were strangely disturbed that afternoon and evening. We thought of going to the Forest Service or the Sheriff's Department, but criminy sakes, is that a thing? Who would believe us? Plus, in our community, they would just want to shoot him. We have since hiked there many times, always hoping to catch another glimpse. We are married ladies with kids, and we take the kids up Bigfoot Canyon periodically in search of our elusive friend. A few years ago, the wind blew down some trees during a storm and exposed an area that we had not seen from the trail before. When we went up there to investigate, we found a large boulder and some older pine trees with branches low to the ground around it. You could duck down and go under the trees near the wall of the boulder, and it looked as if someone or something had made a natural shelter there. The pine needles had all been tramped down, and it seemed to be away from the prevailing winds. A great place for a deer, bear, or perhaps a Bigfoot. We hope so. I will never look at life on Earth the same way. I've seen Bigfoot, and not only does it make for a great tale around the campfire at night, it fuels my imagination about every little sound I hear when I am in the wilderness. I am intrigued. I only hope that no harm comes to the Bigfoot. I believe that the great creator of all life shares the sight of the Bigfoot with people who might grow from the experience. 
I know Linda and I have both grown. Even if we share the experience with someone who doesn't believe us, it really does not matter. We know what we saw. He was so close in proximity, it was obvious to us that this fella belonged there. He's as natural as the sky, creek, trees, and the deer. It was a beautiful fall day. Clear, but a little bite in the air. 2 o'clock p.m., ponderosa pines and cedar. Near the foundation of an old deer hunter's cabin and a trickle of a creek. I spoke with an Australian mountain biker who had a strange experience a few years ago directly on the other side of the mountain, on the Tahoe side. He said he was riding his bike and exercising his German shepherd. He said he kept smelling something dead. He said his dog was running ahead of him. Suddenly, he said, his dog yelped and turned around without waiting for him and ran back down the mountain. This man said that he never did see anything, but he felt there was something watching him, and he said he felt the hair on his neck and arms prickle. He thought maybe it was a bear, but the smell kept coming back to him. On to the next one. Near Maiden in the Pine Nut Mountains in Douglas County, Nevada, in October, around 9 p.m., there are numerous springs in the area, not far from Highway 395. I did not see anything because it was pitch black at night. Being stranded, tired, and miles from help added to the terror to the ordeal. But I was of sound mind and positive of what happened. I never saw anything because of the darkness. It's what I heard that's important. I was 18 miles off Highway 395, cutting firewood for the upcoming winter. I was driving down a logging road when a piece of brush tore out my transmission line. I had no choice but to walk out. After walking eight miles, it was dark. This is when I encountered a large, screaming animal walking towards me, breaking trees. When I heard the first scream, I was so startled, I jumped two feet in the air. I never go in the mountains unarmed. I was carrying a 30-round SKS. I could hear this beast was extremely angry and coming straight at me. I threw the safety off of my rifle and fired ten rounds over the head where the creature was making his noise, which would have been 50 yards to the south of me. It stopped its advance toward me. Then it started to move in the opposite direction uphill, all while screaming and breaking trees along the way until it crested a large hill. I continued to walk to town, thinking to myself what would have been the outcome if I had not been armed. My family, who had been searching for me since dusk, they eventually picked me up. There was pinyon and juniper forest with logging roads. It was extremely rocky, and steep hills color this area. I'm of Native American descent, the Washu tribe. After speaking with smelters in the tribe, they informed me the creature could have either been a Bigfoot or Hanawiwi. On to the next one. The following are accounts of wild men from the turn of the century that remarkably share a lot of similarities with the modern-day Bigfoot and Sasquatch encounters. The Placer Herald of Saturday tells the following interesting story. A gentleman by the name of S. Norman was in town the other day and told a rather sensational story about a wild man who has been discovered out near Bear River. In this county, in the wooded region between Gautier's and the McCourtney Crossing, his den was first found by some boys who were out on foot after cattle. On the south side of Bear River, at a point where the bank consists of large boulders, for some distance up the side of the canyon, there is one place where the rock the size of houses have so lodged as to form a natural cavern. The boys, in climbing over the rocks, saw the opening and concluded to explore it. As they neared the place, they noticed in the bottom of a small ravine 
leading to the cave evidences of a trodden path and the plain signs of human footprints. This further excited their curiosity, and they concluded that some Indians had been occupying the place temporarily. On reaching the opening, they were further surprised to find a short distance from the mouth, bones were numerous near the cave, and on the ledge of rock rested about half of a small-sized hog which had been dressed by skinning. Well back in the cave was a lot of old sacks, rags, and leaves, so impressed as to indicate that they had been used for a bed. All the signs showed that the occupant or occupants were men, and that the place had not been long deserted. They got to speculating as to what might happen if the owners, whatever it, he or she, or they might be, should find them there. They prudently concluded to retire a short distance, and from behind a pile of rocks where the cave could be seen by them, watch a while for at least for development. With this idea in view, they started to climb over the rocks, but had not gone more than fifty yards when they were startled by an unearthly scream followed immediately by the whizzing of a rock past their heads. They turned and looked in the direction whence came the noise, and they saw, standing on a large flat rock about seventy-five yards distant, and on the further side of the cave from them, a veritable wild man of the wood, or the cave dweller of the foothill. He hurled rocks at them at such a lively rate they found it necessary to take shelter behind boulders, and by dodging from one to another they soon got away. They described him as stalwart in form, a bronze color, naked except covered head to toe in rough hair. The boys reported their discovery, and the neighborhood, as may be suspected, has become considerably excited, and while everybody is anxious to know more of the strange cave dweller, there are few who care to take responsibility of visiting this habitation. There is talk of organizing an expedition for the purpose of thoroughly investigating the case and capturing the wild creature. The loss of many pig and calf, the mysterious disappearances of which has been cause of ugly suspicions among the neighbors, is now accounted for, and the feeling in that section is that the wild man must be captured or driven away, or the people there continue to stand the loss of such of their animals as he wants to eat. Who the man is or where he came from, nobody from the neighborhood seems to know. His appearance and the sign about his habitation indicate that he had been there a long time. Al Hutchings, an employee at Markham's Mill, discovered a wild man last Monday that is more than a match for the one Sheriff Mulgrew unearthed a year ago. Hutchlings was strolling leisurely in the bushes, about two miles from the mills, when he heard a crackling sound proceeding from a clump of live oak. He thought it was a bear, and stood for a few seconds with his rifle ready to get a shot at the supposed bear when it emerged from the covering. When the creature did make its appearance, it presented a sight that made Hutchings' hair stand on end. It was nothing more or less than a human being having a wild, maniacal look and covered down to the knee with a growth of long, shaggy hair. Hutchings stood as if rooted to the spot. The weird-looking creature strode or half-leapt out into the clearing and looked about as if fearing someone was near. Being evidently satisfied that there were no intruders in the vicinity, the wild man gave vent to a deep, guttural sigh and seated himself on his haunches. During this time, Hutchings cautiously retired behind a neighboring tree, from which point of vantage he obtained a complete view of the freak. Hutchings state that the wild man was about five feet eight or nine inches tall. The hair which fell from his head was fully two feet long, very matted and of a reddish hue. His face was scantly covered with beard of a sandy color. A thick growth of hair covered the body to such an extent that it appeared as if the man wore a woolen garment. So effectively did it cover his person. After squatting on his haunches for a few minutes, the strange specimen of humanity stretched himself out for a nap in the blazing sunlight. Fearing to rouse the wild animal, 
to active hostilities were he to make his presence known, Hutchings quietly slipped away, leaving the strange son of Adam to enjoy his repose in peace. No one living in the vicinity of Markham's has ever seen the man before. From Hutchings' description, the wild man is about 40 years of age. It is believed that he is an escaped lunatic who has long been given up as dead. Hutchings and three men intend to search the county and capture the human freak, if they can do so without taking his life. John Wilson Williamson, a mining man, reports the discovery of a wild man on the desert four miles below Chuck Warren's ranch on Big Morongo Pass. The freak bears evidence of having lived underground and was extremely difficult to approach. The wild man of Borneo has been found in Kern County near the headquarters of Muta Creek in the Alamo Mountains about 60 miles south of the city. Has La Flores Canyon a wild man? This question confronted the men who were working in the Mount Low Railroad today. Las Flores Canyon is the first canyon west of Rubio Canyon, and a wagon road runs up to the head of it. The canyon is a pretty big one, being almost the only pretty one saved from the devastation of forest fires. It is a favorite place for picnickers. Today, shortly after dinner, Two section hands from the Rubio Canyon walked around the Las Flores. Near the mouth of the canyon, they met two men in a buggy who stopped them to state that there was a naked man, evidently crazy, a little outside the canyon. The two men started curiously in the direction indicated and found a middle-aged, slightly bald, smooth-faced, sandy-complexioned man of large proportions sitting on a rock under a small oak about 20 feet from the roadside, along which vehicles pass quite frequently, there being some houses in the canyon. There was not a stitch of clothing on the man, not even shoes or a hat. He held a garment in his lap and went through a senseless ceremony which reminded the onlookers of a monkey's antics. He kept incessantly an incoherent monologue and hummed a tune. The two men from Rubio approached within a few paces, making enough noise to attract the attention of an ordinary mongrel, but failed to arouse the freak. They debated whether to accost him, but concluded upon sizing up his gigantic muscular development that, in saying they wished no business with him, and saying he evidently wished no business with them. So the two men went back to work without disturbing the stranger, but the mystery of the thing worries them. Perhaps some man who has been fighting fire has become suddenly deranged by the heat and smoke and hardship and is wandering about in search of his people. Perhaps he is an escapee from the asylum, or perhaps he is a harmless freak whose crankiness takes this particular turn. On to the next one. near Meredith in Roscommon County in Michigan. My family would camp at the intersection one quarter section east of 18 and one quarter section north of Pond Road. The sighting occurred on a dirt road, one quarter section north of our camp. While attending a family hunting trip, several of us were walking on a two track north of our camp. We were almost a quarter mile from camp climbing a steep portion of the road. Suddenly, the four of us stopped dead in our tracks. At the top of the two track, a large, dark figure stood in the middle of the road, staring at us. The thing was quite tall and very broad across the chest. The arms were longer than a man, and it seemed frozen as it looked at us. I could not make out any features, but am certain that it was not a person. It looked more like one of the drawings or statues I've seen on the internet or in books. After what seemed like forever, it was probably only a minute or so, we turned and ran back to camp. I'm not sure what the thing at the top of the hill did, but we didn't stick around. Several years later, 
a few of us discuss the sighting, and those who aren't necessarily believers in Bigfoot had no explanation as to what we saw. We also noticed large, pushed-in footprints in the general area of the sighting. The depressions were in soft gravel and sand, and were not well defined. I've hunted and camped in this location for decades. It was in the early afternoon on an overcast cool fall day. The area was hardwood and some wet areas. There were also pines mixed in the area. This area has since been clear-cut and is nothing like it used to be. This area is located a quarter mile from the Mid Forest Lodge Preserve, which is a large, private hunting and camping area. On to the next one. In Benzonia, in Benzie County in Michigan, it was early in the morning, I think around 6 a.m. It was fall. I was going to school at the time, and I'd have to walk about a quarter of a mile to get on the bus. That morning, it was dusk, and I was waiting for the school bus. I was alone. I was facing the road, and to the left in the back of me was a grove of wood. I was standing there, and I heard very heavy footsteps in the dried leaves. I moved down the road about six to ten feet, and it took about two more steps. Whatever it was, it was watching me. I was very scared, so I thought I'd walk down to the next bus stop, which was about a quarter of a mile away. When I started walking, then I seen the school bus was coming, so I ran back to meet the bus, and when the bus stopped to pick me up, I heard a growl behind me in the woods. That day, when I came home from school, I looked all around for anything, and I could not find anything. I don't know whatever it was, but it was watching me. I also noticed a growl. It was early in the morning at about 6 a.m. It was still very dark out. It was cold and a little damp. The sight was on the edge of a grove of wood not too far off the road. On to the next one. In Mantashi County in Michigan, we were at a migrant worker camp in Bear Lake, Michigan, picking apples. I stepped out of our house for what reason I can't remember. I happened to look in a direction up toward the hill, and I seen something walking. And now, reflecting on its body shape and height and the way it walked, I know it wasn't human because this thing was at least nine or ten feet tall, if not bigger. I never told anyone. I was about fourteen or fifteen years old. I believe they exist. I remember being in the woods, riding my motorcycle. I would stop to look for deer, and would get a scary feeling, and I would leave. I say it was about seven to nine p.m. On to the next one. A couple traveling north from Davidson in Genesee County in Michigan saw a shaggy black creature walking off the road. The creature walked into a deep ditch as their vehicle approached it and they did not stop. On to the next one. Wichita. These are Kansas area First Nation. From a story written and retold in the 1930s by Edward S. Curtin in the North American Indian, there is the old tale of a great flood that covered much of the earth, which was told among the Wichita tribe in Kansas. The story mentions the water rising at its peak to the head of four huge beasts, quite obviously beings considered giant. As the four beasts grow tired, one is described to fall to the south, the second is said to fall to the west, the third is described to fall in the direction of, as the book notes, where the cold wind comes from, and the fourth is said to fall in place where their bones are described to be found from then on. The story bears a strong likeness and similarity to another story, which has been told by a Pawnee, Nebraska-area First Nations man in William 
Buffalo Bill Cody's 1879 autobiography, Buffalo Bill. From that story, the Pawnee Man had proved the claim with a giant human thigh bone, which the surgeon in Buffalo Bill's camp was also then able to verify. The Pawnee Man also had a much similar story to account for such giant human-like bones, which could still sometimes be found on the plains in neighboring Nebraska, right next door to the Wichita tribe in Kansas. According to him, there were once giants who long ago had lived in the area. That is, until a flood had drowned all of them out. He had stated that this is the reason why giant human bones can still sometimes be found within that same region. Much like the Pawnee account, the Wichita story, along with very few current Bigfoot Sasquatch sightings, reports from this same area seem to positively verify that the giants no longer or hardly ever wander these flat regions of Kansas and Nebraska anymore, and sometimes maybe their bones from long ago can still be found in this area of the Central Plains region. The Puyallup are mostly settled on the reservation land along the shores of the Puget Sound in the upper Pierce County in Washington State, just north of the Nisqually. They, at one time, lived throughout a broader range of western Washington State. In David George Gordon's 1992 book, Field Guide to Sasquatch, there is the mention of what some Northwest tribes, like the Puyallup and Nisqually, call Seattle. This creature is referenced to in the book as a dreaded race of mountain giants that kidnap children and could drive adults insane. From Ella Clark's 1953 book titled Indian Legends of the Pacific Northwest is the mention of the Setco, also described as an evil spirit. The location of Spirit Lake was considered long before the explosion on Mount St. Helens in 1980 ever took place, and there was a lot more trees as quoted in the book, the home of many evil spirits. They were the spirits of many people from different tribes who had been cast out because of their wickedness. Banding themselves together, these demons called themselves Setco and gave themselves up to wrongdoing. As the book mentions, these creatures are said to imitate the call of any bird, the sound of wind in the trees, the cries of wild beasts. They could make these sounds seem to be near or seem to be far away. This became an effective use of the creature's ability to trick the Indian as the story in the book also suggests. The Nisqually The Nisqually lived very near present-day Olympia, Washington, on what is now reservation land. They used to roam between the reaches of Mount Rainier and Puget Sound. Documented accounts among Washington State Nisqually tribe of Bigfoot, Sasquatch-like creatures go way back to 1856. That's when George Gibbs first recorded and addressed the Nisqually tribe's fear associated with this creature described to leave behind giant, man-like, 18-inch footprints. In an article written by James Wickersham titled Nisqually Mythology, and published in Volume 32, Issue 190 of Overland Monthly and Out West Magazine in October of 1898, is the mention of what seems to be four different personages of what we may now know of today more commonly as Bigfoot Sasquatch. The first and most frightening personage given by the Nisqually from the article refers to Thiko. By definition in the article, Thiko is labeled as the demon of the dark forest. As the article goes on to relate some of the following details, the Thiko is a malicious demon having the form of a man but larger, quick, and stealthy. He inhabits the dark recesses of the wood. He sleeps by day, but sallies forth at dusk for a night of it. He robs traps, breaks canoes, steals food, and other portable property. 
he waylays belated travelers and is set to kill all those whose bodies are found dead. To his wicked and malicious cunning is credited all the unfortunate and malicious acts which cannot be otherwise explained. He steals children and brings them up as slaves in his dark retreat. He is a constant menace to the disobedient child and is an object of fear and terror to all. The next spirit that may be associated with Bigfoot Sasquatch based on certain details is referred to as Tubade. As the article goes on to mention, Tubade is the spirit of the swamps and thickets. When the squally apps hear the voice of Tubade, they become lost and wander aimlessly about. Tubade does no damage to the person. No one can see it, but simply to hear its voice causes one to become lost, prevents one from knowing the right direction or finding one's home. In all cases where persons are lost in the woods, it is because they have heard the cry of Tubade, who turned them in the wrong direction. If people were lost to Tubade and never found, we can only imagine how nice Tubade really was. The Nisqually must have located some of those who were lost or had found their way back home, who had possibly later noted the above observation of strange noises which may have caused them to become lost. This bears a lot of similarities and suggestions to what some in the Yakima tribe have said in the past about Bigfoot and Sasquatch as well, which, according to them, can also cause one to become lost or lose their mind by making strange and undetectable noises. Among the Yakima, there is also the troubling superstition and suggestion that the unfortunate victim forget whatever else could have happened along the way. Could this be from an all-out mental denial of what may have actually occurred or taken place? Similar, more recent observations are still brought forth in the first two missing 411 books by David Palladies. Is it possible through the power of regressive hypnosis, if that power ex exists, that those who have been lost and recovered in our woodlands can recollect further details than they may have otherwise forgotten? Who knows? Could it be worth a try? A more sensitive side to Bigfoot Sasquatch could very well be related in the description of the spirit of Zakad, and, as is also mentioned from the same story and in the same article as follows, Thakad is another spirit of the swamp. It is heard to cry at night in the swamp, in dead wood or other lonely places, but particularly out near Spanaway Lake. It is derived from the squally word to cry when one's relative or friend dies, and the voice of the spirit is an omen of death. Not that it will cause death, for it merely announces a fact known to it through its intimacy with the spirits of the dead. It would seem that the noises made by the spirit could possibly be in imitation of the wails and cries of those who are grieving a dead loved one, which a creature like the Bigfoot or Sasquatch may then also imitate, or it might be the realization of a death within its neighboring boundaries, or can this creature sense those who are sick, injured, or dying? which is a similarity shared with other predators. Who knows? The fourth and final spirit, which seems to have some possible relevance toward existence of Bigfoot Sasquatch, is known as Lalade. Lalade is referred to as the spirit of the wind. As the article goes on to note, when First Nations children hear the sharp musical sound of the wind at night as it cuts the corner of their lowly home, it is accepted as the call of a lalade. When the trees bend musically before the breeze, when a stronger wind overturns the great fir and cedar trunks, it is the force of lalade, the spirit of the wind. According to what the Nisqually relate to the author, every sound of the wind, every whistle, moan, or sigh, even the roar of the storm is the voice of lalade. The description of lalade somewhat fits other tribal suggestions of Sasquatch having the ability to change weather patterns. Also, the observation of the downed trunks of great trees 
is still often noted today. What is mentioned could be an observation of Bigfoot Sasquatch, which sometimes caused mysterious damage in and near surrounding forests, especially in areas where logging or construction had taken place. And workers observed big, fallen trees to their return on the job the next day, without any other explanation of what could have caused the damage. Something strong. The wind is probably also often blamed in these similar circumstances as well. In another article is another mention of strange lakes and this creature's ability to change weather patterns. As the article mentions, between Mount Adams and Mount Rainier is a region of small lakes which First Nations used to gather huckleberries and hunt for small game. It is in this area of many small lakes and tall trees where the First Nations believed spirits who controlled the weather would also dwell. In another book written by Cecilia Smith Carpenter in 1994 titled Where the Waters Begin, the traditional Nisqually Indian history of Mount Rainier, there are additional details to Bigfoot Sasquatch in relation to the fishing season, which are given by the Nisqually, as the book relates. They come down chiefly in the fishing season, at which time the First Nations are excessively afraid of them. This may yet be another example of Native American observations of Bigfoot Sasquatch desire for fish. In this case, the Nisqually's fear of Sasquatch relate to the fishing season, at which time these creatures come in closer contact with humans when the fish are more abundant and easier to get at. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye! I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!